chapter 10 is about like using resampling and it's about um it, it says for evaluating performance but i i i think that it's kind of for in my, in my imprint in my opinion based upon my understanding which which laura you missed some of the early apollo the pre-apology of like I'm not, I'm, I understand kind of what I was doing in this chapter, trying to put this together, but I don't necessarily understand why we're doing some of these techniques. So, but my understanding is it's not necessarily for evaluating performance, it's for like um, improve, kind of improving performance of the model by doing these different sampling techniques. Um, and, and so we're not getting bias. And then, and they talked about, um, the difference between in the very beginning they did a linear model a, a relatively simple linear model although not it's not just y y by x it's uh it was i forget what exactly it was it was sale price by neighborhood living area year built building type and so on and so forth so actually that's a fairly complicated linear model um but then they also they compared that to uh that that's same sort of model with a random forest which is this actually what i'm showing you here but but also versus a linear uh, just a simple linear model with the same sort of formula i believe mm -hmm. and they talked about um they talked about um low bias versus high bias and this is a part where i'm hoping y'all can help me a little bit but they said that the uh my understanding was that they said that the random forest model was low bias and the the linear model was high bias. Yeah, that makes it, sense because um, the more likely you are to overfit, that's more of like a um, higher variance, but lower bias. And random forest, of course, is a lot more, um, you know, fitting to the data, I guess, going on um, versus linear model is relatively inflexible, right? So it's lower variance, but higher bias. It's like that bias variance trade off. Um, if you're yeah, and there was a term. there was a graph, but uh, I seem to have lost it um where they showed did they update this this morning because i swear to god i was looking at a different page oh i'm in chapter 11 that's why <laughs> okay uh that would explain a lot uh, dang where is it it was a graph there this one right this has to do with uh uh, resampling actually more than anything else but as you your, your variance decreases as you do more uh folds um is that this is that related or not or not really we, I, well, we did, the, the we low did, high did. bias between between the model types i'm really out of my element here guys i'm really sorry no, <laughs> That, that's that's what we we're doing so um uh, this uh, is the a way when you do resampling is a way to have uh, a different composition of your data set so in a way that you can trust your model as much as possible when you test it on on the test set so if you do more resamplings more more uh subgroups of your um more replication of your data set uh, with different compositions of of your observation you might be able to trust more your result because you can think about that you are testing it it's just as the same as testing on a testing set okay yeah, and I think well, here's what I'm, I'm taking from that graph is that's that's a replication. If I'm looking at the um, graph yeah, sorry, I scrolled a, up. No, it's fine. Of a tenfold cross validation, so each time you do ten different folds, so maybe you know holding out twenty percent and then eighty percent being used in the model. So I think the idea is the more you replicate, even the tenfold cross validation, the um, the closer you're going to get to that true estimate of um let's just say the the less the inflation on the true sigma will be <laughs> shown from the data and I, i'm probably not expressing it very well here so the more basically the more you sample the more you do it the closer you get to like that true true value um the population value i guess maybe true is probably not the right word there that's kind of what i 
am taking away from this graph. I'm going to be honest, I have not read this chapter yet. I should have, okay. but other things. Uh, I'm going to rely on you later, Laura, about oh, the, gosh. Uh, about the, uh, uh, the we'll time can... sampling. The time we'll, sampling. We'll get oh, to that. Yeah. We'll, we'll see if I can come up with some stuff on the fly. <laughs> this sounds good, at least, right? Yeah. Laura, the word truth, I guess, the, the comment, uh, the, the, the word you're using in truth, if you replace it with accuracy, would that also be familiar so yeah i guess maybe that's probably you're getting better. more and more accurate to the to the actual modeling of what's going on yes, with the data that's kind of that's a good way to put it it's like the, the popular like what it really theoretically is in the wild and the funny thing is these true pot these population parameters right are a theoretical concept i guess unless you have a very right small population but um still well, useful I one for statistics I've always taken the the concept that you're never going to be perfect. You're never going to be 100% accurate. So the closer you can get without overfitting or without introducing too much bias, it's a balancing act. And by resampling, you're trying to gain confidence, as Frederico was mentioning, you're trying to gain confidence in the model that you're you're using as it applies between testing and training so that you are are as close to perfect as possible. But again, you're never going to reach that perfect point. So it's it's yeah. the it's the balancing act, kind of a tight wire between going too much bias and and now you're just making noise uh, or predicting false uh, claims out of your data, or the other direction where you're just ignoring any of the importance of what the data is telling you. It's yeah, it's this, exactly. It's that bias variance trade off, right? Yeah. I don't know yeah. if you're still following along with the uh, with the ISLR cohorts but um you know that that concept just comes up there's stuff like overlap between this book and that one but that concept just comes up all the time it's like ah the bias variance trade-off shows its uh self yet again in this different method okay um yeah go ahead Frederica. Oh. Um, I was uh, I was thinking that uh, maybe uh, when when uh, having a disposition all different uh, uh, names for uh, residuals for errors for I don't know sigma the uh, deviance from 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 the mean and the variance as well so they are all same concept in some uh, uh, holistic in speaking. Uh, so we are uh, uh, trying to identify the differences between our observations and the result of our model. So this, this discrepancies between the prediction, the value of the prediction and uh, uh, our observations is the things that we are dealing with. So we want to reduce that bit as much as possible. So we 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 make like inferences on these residuals or errors. So the, this uh, differences between y and y hat because y is the uh, is our uh, response variable uh, with observe so made of uh, real uh, values. So it's made of our observations and the y hat it, uh, it's our uh, prediction okay so uh, at some point we, we we do averages of these residuals we do the de de deviances we do variances and um, when you think about the variance as a measure uh, it's it's very important because it's consistent somehow. Uh, somehow it relates as well with uh, sigma as well as with mean, and so you might want to use the variance and reduce the variance as much as possible. So all this is all correlated uh, with the residuals. <laughs> at the end of the story. But, yeah. There was kind of a comment at the end of this chapter, or some in either the notes from previous cohorts or or also maybe from the book, I can't remember. But like, um, they said something along the lines of now choose a different seed and see how it differs too. So even your, your literal sample can play a role. <laughs> the random yeah. the RNG that you use uh, can play a role in the outputs that you get, which I thought was uh, very true, but also like, kind of I was a little surprised by it. I'll, it 
even though it makes sense um yeah yeah i will i will maybe at this purpose i would say that uh, you 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 and and this is the the things that he said so you cannot be perfect no you know you cannot be perfect so you you might want to be closer as much as possible but so but you you need to think about everything uh, but all all these slightly changes within the seeds within the the, the resampling within the testing set uh, are all small differences that can be used somehow. So to say, I've made a better model than yours, but uh, you leave yourself like a threshold uh, differences within different results and say, I accept, I accept this result because it's within my threshold. So, but you need to build up your threshold and say, okay, uh, I made a model. What is the, the, the left bound of my model? What is the right side of my uh, right bound of my model? My best result, you know? Uh, and, uh, but you, 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 you know, you are knowledge, you are aware, sorry, you are aware that you might not be able to be perfect to, 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 to make the, the, the perfection and but there are lots of differences because you you might want you might consider the seed and you don't consider the cross validation so the resampling and vice versa and yeah. well let's get into that then hopefully um so i uh i created a script here to kind of run through all of the code that was in the book more or less um and because uh, I don't know the previous chapters. I always find myself trying to follow along as as we go. Um, in fact, where is this thing? Is it my downloads folder, desktop, or something? <laughs> Sorry, my computer's a mess. Um, I think I put it here. Where's the darn thing? It's like chapter ten. I was going to say, Brandon, don't feel bad about losing uh, files on your computer. I'm the oh, same it's right way. here in front of me. It's right here in front of me. <laughs> what I was going to do, holy crap, can't get my screen back. Uh, what I was going to do is drop it in the in the club, if I can do that. Um, that way, y'all can follow along if you like. But but I'm trying to run all the code in the in the in the book. Ah, oh, jeez. This thing sometimes it doesn't doesn't do the so it doesn't bring the R forward. It's been bugging me for actually years. Um, so so I, like I said previously, like um, they always more or less start with this sort of uh, this sort of structure where you're pulling in the AIMS data, you're mutating it, uh, mutating the sales price um, into a, a log scale, um, and then you create the split with the train and the test. And then, and then you can start doing all the analysis. So they they have a, a linear model that's that we define here, um, with all these recipe steps. And then, uh, and then they do the workflow. And then you do the fit. And then you have a fit object which has pretty much all of the all of the information outputs from a from a, a model would be. And then they also do a random forest model. And the idea here is that you have both of those models. Um, and they do very different things in the way that they interpret the data. Um, random force, in this case, I believe they're using a thousand trees and those trees, they say later in the chapter are using bootstrapping style techniques um, for each one of those thousand trees. And then what they do is they, they, they pull the information and try and compare that information between those, those performances of the models for, the testing and the training set. Um, I put all that stuff together, hopefully. So you can see here that if this is, hopefully this is big enough for y'all. Um, you know, for the for the linear model on the training set, we have the R, R mean squared error and the uh, R squared value. And you can see that the, um, um, the random forest model performs a little bit better in general. Um, and I think that that's kind of the first stepping stone towards, uh, you know, saying that sampling techniques are useful. So um, 
you're improving the the predictive capacity of it. Although it's strange because I think a little bit further down they 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 showed that the the random forest model actually because of the bias variance trade off over predicts can over predict not necessarily always does but can over predict and the linear My model is more robust but. My my gut intuition, just looking at that, the fact that the test um, RMSE is quite a bit higher, actually, by you know, than the training on the random forest is kind of a. I'm not saying you did anything. I'm just saying the data, right? Um, because that you, generally you don't want to see a huge difference between training and testing. Um, if so, it can be a sign you've overfit. Um, so I don't know. I'm not sure okay. what they're going to say about that. That's just something that pops out to me. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, well, maybe that was what they were explaining and I didn't quite understand. Um, but that's a good call out because like, uh, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really pick that out. But yes, there, there's a big difference, a twofold difference between the RMSE between the train and the test um, for the random forest model. Um, and, and then they start to, you know, they start to, to get into like all the different types of uh, cross validation and and I'll, I'll I think the pictures in the in the book are are maybe a better place to kind of show that. Um, at first, they kind of they they kind of show you what what is resampling um, and and um, you you're always you're always resampling from your training test tr training set, not your testing set. You you never you never touch the testing until the very end. Um, and you you resample, and there are different ways of of doing that. And so the the first one is where you split your training set up into little smaller sets, and for every every v fold, so v fold is the the, the number. So in this case, three fold validation. They they split the the data and the and the training set up pretty much equally as my and it's randomly assigned. Um, yeah, and so like uh, one of the, one of the things that was pointed out, I think uh, either in one of the previous, I watched a couple of the previous cohorts videos, and they were talking about how if you choose, if you don't have a relatively large data set to start with, so your training set is kind of smaller. Although what smaller is, I don't know. If you choose a whole bunch of folds, and you your your actual model inputs get smaller and smaller and smaller until probably it's not predicting anything. And what that threshold is, I it wasn't clear to me, and it may not be clear. It may depend on what the model inputs are in general, and 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 how good your data fits that. Um, and uh, let's see, here they talk about like you know. Three is not three is not an ideal choice. We usually do five or ten, and and the authors um, prefer tenfold cross validation as kind of a default. Um, there we go. So then they show they show how to do that. So they have this v-fold CV, and you you give it the training set, and then you tell it how many folds you want, and just like just like kind of previously when we talked about, I think it was chapter five, when we were talking about using the data, how we use the data. These splits that you see here are not, they're lazy evaluated, they're lazy eval. So they're kind of, they're they're just references to the original data set. So that's not copying things in memory left and right. Um, and that's really, that's really good because it keeps if you have a happen to have a very large data set you're not you're not making a bunch of copies in memory and they say that here um and the way to read this is that um you you have i believe this is the within it this is the there's two different things what did it say at the, at the up here it's like analysis and assessment parts of the sample and so, as part of the as part of the uh, of the fit, they use they use these parts to to fit the uh, the model itself, and then you do some sort of like analysis test of of your performance. Um, and so you have these splits here within within it, and I believe this is the 
Uh, the 2000 is the, the, the number that are in the uh, model fit. And then, then you have like the assessment as the, the sub part. You can see that it somewhat varies because these splits aren't necessarily even across the data set. Um, let me see. So th then, then we get back to the, the repeated cross validation. So like you can do cross validation once and then you can do that cross validation again and again and again and again and get different subsets, different, different things. And uh, the outputs then are uh, allow you to kind of, um, my understanding here again is quite weak, but it's like you, the purpose here is that you're, you're, you know, increasing this denominator a little bit more by, by adding those, those samples and then therefore your variation, the expected variation that you're not accounting for is decreased. Is that, is that fair? We were kind of talking about it before, but. Yeah, it has to do with the variance of the estimate, right? Um, versus the, the what amount that you're predicting. Uh, the standard error of the RMSC, right? So the more observations, like the, what you would expect the distribution of that prediction estimate. So you could be more confident of, uh, versus like the accuracy, but I'm probably not explaining that well. So if anybody, or I'm getting it totally wrong. So if anybody wants to jump in. Uh, so Sigma is not like, uh, see, I'm trying to look here up at this text, uh, error, estimate standard error. Yeah, so the estimate of the, okay, so this is saying the RMSC is a statistic of choice. So, however, because it is like a, it is a statistic, right? There's a standard error associated with it. The more you replicate that cross validation, the um, more that the, t the tighter the estimate of that RMSC, you know, um, so it's like the, the distribution gets narrower around that mean. That's kind of what I'm seeing. The more you replicate, for instance, tenfold cross validation in this case. Yeah, because I may be cutting it off, but they said that as you resample, the expectation is that it, it is normally distributed, the RMSC yes. itself. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the way to do that is to uh, give it the training set, tell it how many uh, folds you want to do and how many times you want to repeat it. And this creates a tibble of link 50, so five times 10. Um, and, then, uh, and then you can, you can run your model with, these, uh, with, this, with this input. Uh, and we'll get to that later because there's slightly different functions. The fit is called fit underscore resample instead of just fit. And it uses this, these folds, these split data sets as, uh, as input. Um, leave one out cross validation. There's, there's no love for this in this book or in the cohorts previous. <laughs> uh, most people just seem to skip it. Um, uh, I remember leave one out as being a little more important back when, uh, when, when I was first starting to try and understand some of these techniques uh, a long time ago, but like uh, apparently that's, no longer something that's really done. Yeah, that's so interesting to me because in the ISLR book, and I've, I think from some of the videos I've watched that associate with the ISLR, those authors see, now they're, you know, older school people, I think. Um, I don't think they even use like the tidy verse or anything like that, but they seem to like leave one out. Federica, Ryan, you guys have, is that your impression yeah. <laughs> too? But I know you guys have been in those cohorts. That's so I don't know. It's just interesting to me when I'm to the tidy models guide for that book. It was like, it's not integrated. We don't really recommend it. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. One assume that it's using more efficient sampling or, or more efficient cross validation. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say that, that older statistical modeling methods use one format or uh, workflow. And then when you cross over into this tidy models world, you've got a whole different programming that does a lot of the work for you automatically. So you don't have to use those features. Uh, you don't have to, to uh, view or, or go through those older statistical methods. Yeah. And I guess if you were doing like a lot of the replications of the cross validation, right? Theoretically, you could be doing getting the benefit of fitting many different 
models on different splits of the data. Um, so I don't know, that's just a thought that occurred to me. Yeah. yeah, I mean, here, their, their biggest argument is that it's computationally excessive. If you think about having to fit, what was it like 20, 2200, 2300 models, instead of fitting, say, 50, um, as we've done with the, uh, the resampling above, um, there's a huge difference in computational time there, um, potentially, depending on the, the complexity of the model. So I understand the reasons. It's just I was kind of surprised to see how <laughs> how how dismissive pre some people were about it <laughs> um but it's it yeah not too important it's not too difficult to do if you want to use uh leave one out you you use this function i didn't put any uh a, i didn't put any leave one out um stuff into the script that i sent to the to the group a minute ago so it's just not there and then monte carlo cross validation um this one is uh if i understand correctly it's it's previous resampling, previous sampling didn't reuse elements, didn't reuse rows of data. Um, whereas Monte Carlo samples the rows every time and you can have overlaps, you can have repeats of the same rows within, uh, within a, a, a set that is brought forward to be fit. Um, and um, I, I, again, I don't really understand the trade-offs there. People seem to be quite positive about Monte Carlo cross-validation in my understanding of it, but like uh, resampling the resampling data that is um, you like rows twice within a within a within a, a training set. I'm not. I don't know that that makes sense to me. Like, I'm not really under, I'm not really understanding why that's why that's useful because repeating data that you don't really like repeating one row that you you have like why does that why does that helpful? I'm I'm not really understanding that. I think it yeah. kind of go, oh Federica, you jump in. No, I'm a, I'm a, sorry. I'm just saying that it might be possible that you have a. Um, uh, a repetition of observation in reality. So it takes consideration of this uh, uh, extreme conditions and some for, for some kind of data, for some kind of prediction that that's the best way to, to make uh, um, a resampling. And as well as, uh, the, I, I think the same as you, as well when you think about even, even the bootstrapping, for example, it's, it's one more, uh way to to do the things and they are quite similar and so they, they have slightly differences uh and they will be uh they, they are useful for different kind of the different kind of data basically can you say more about that like where because that wasn't explained in these in these notes at all like what kind of data other than the time series data being obviously very needing to be sampled in a very particular way what do you, do you know what sort of data benefits from monte carlo bootstrapping or just regular old vfold um i can't say uh, you, you you can think about that you when you do cross validation you just have a matrix of numbers you don't think about anything else about shuffling the numbers within them and uh, uh, making groups and then with monte carlo maybe things think take you you can think about that um, uh, as uh, taking consideration of frequencies of some of observations so they can repeat themselves it depends by the phenomenon you are an analyzing and not only, maybe I said incorrectly, the type of data, but the type of phenomenon that you are going to analyze. Hmm. Yeah, I think the intuition behind some of the bootstrapping, right, is that you only have one chance to take a sample. You'd love to take repeated samples, but you can't. And so theoretically, if you introduce that like resampling into your validation process one observation that is found in the population could be found a, you know multiple times within that population so that kind of resampling can mimic that um and it's it's random right you could get multiple observations of 
you know, or multiple instances of a certain observation, depending on how your race sampling goes. So almost maybe mimicking some of the inherent variation uncertainty that would be in the underlying population. That's kind of how I think about it. So, so let's say you had the iris data set, right? You could end up with a sample that is all one subspecies sort of thing. Theoretically, you could, right? But you'd be doing this many, many times, right? right? And you so, could end up with the other ones as well, right? You could, yeah, you could. But again, the, you know, think about the probability of getting all of that. It probably wouldn't happen, I guess, if you did enough uh, resample, enough folds of validation, perhaps, it, and they were small enough. Although, what is it, 90-10 in Monte Carlo. So that's, yeah. uh, if, if you had like about one third of each of the species, uh, pretty low odds, I would think, intuitively, to get all of one in, in a split. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, and then there was this talk of uh, validation sets. So you, you pull your, um, you, you pull training, validation, and testing um, data kind of all at once. So there's a new subgroup of validation where you, you've, you've sampled your, your full data set, you've created your training and your testing, and then you have this intermediate group of validation. Um, and the way that that happens is with this validation split um, uh, function. And uh, they've set a different seed for, for this particular work. Um, but the, the sets, the validation set looks a bit like this, where you have uh, a, a slightly smaller training data set. Because previously, remember, it was about 200 or so. We were doing cross fold validation. And the validation set's a little bit bigger. Um, I, I also failed to understand. <laughs> why you would do this because like why are you creating an intermediate sample to validate your model before you validate it on the testing set i'm i'm i was a little lost on this um i don't know if anybody has any input there either i'm sorry i'm making y'all work this week no it's fine <laughs> i mean honestly i i, I was I was happy to see that how they define validation versus testing because I had not had a really clear um, understanding of that earlier. But yeah, I guess I think to me, I just when I, I kind of chuckle when I saw that this graph and the previous one you showed because my kind kind of stuff like the idea of having enough data to do that, <laughs> you know, where you could really give up yeah. stuff for both validation and testing i it's like okay like that's cool but i mean maybe I'm facebook sure there are has that much data i'm right? sure but, they do yeah. i'm sure like these the big tech companies but it seems like i don't know a lot of stuff i see is more the cross-fold validation especially if you don't have uh you know you don't have like a ton of ton of data and you really want to make good use of it so yeah i guess it's like you split it up in the validation and then you do the final testing on your model now i'm curious once you've done your validation and then do you go back and refit it to the all the not testing data i haven't read this chapter so i probably should know the answer to that but i don't i don't believe I guess so we'll scroll down okay so you I, I don't believe only so only do it on the training well and the thing is is that they didn't spend a lot of time on this it, yeah, and I think it's because crossfold is more common, you know, at least the stuff that I've seen, crossfold yeah. validation. Like there's horrible. there's this is like the extent of the the code that that is the validation set code pretty much. It's um it was it was kind of a little thin on the details if you ask me in general on on why why would you want to do this? Um and maybe that's in one of these other books that y'all are in the no, he, no, no, they mentioned they mentioned it. They mentioned it somewhere, somewhere. I don't know that I, I can tell you precisely. Well, I mean, but it then, says here they're used when the data pool is very large, and we kind of discussed that. But I, okay, yeah, yeah, uh, and even even if you you make a validation set, if you want to to test the efficiency, the accuracy or the efficiency of your model before testing, testing for for the final fit, so you do. Uh, a full test split of your training set 
and then uh, like you conclude your analysis with your it's like you concluding your analysis with your training set that you have split it within an assessment analysis and assessment set and then when you're happy with the result you finally testing on the testing set uh, because this this is because you can do more models you do more models more than one on the then different kinds of models so you finally decide for which one between a certain number of models is the best one for you and then you finally uh, do the, the, the final uh, testing on the testing set. <laughs> so, I, I guess I get it, but I got I also don't because <laughs> it feels like that was the purpose of the training testing to me. And then you're taking your training and splitting it between training testing again. Um, and they said that uh, not not only the authors, uh, but more than one book says uh, that uh, it, you you shouldn't uh, you shouldn't t uh, test uh, your uh, model on uh, the testing set uh, if if it's not the last fit. So the um, it, it, it's a it's a it's a matter of having new data. You have a you you analyzing a phenomenon, and then you, you don't know what's happening in the future. No, you you are attempting to predict this uh, the, the result, and then uh, you know new data can 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 arise, can happen, and new things can happen, and they may be within the average of your observation, but they go they, they can be outliers. So. Uh, the, 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 you pre-testing the testing set uh, to I don't know just like to to guess it, to to guess the, the, the right the right conclusion basically. Hmm. All right, we'll move on to bootstrapping. Um, bootstrapping uh, um, is is actually the one I I think earlier when I was talking about. Um, uh, Monte Carlo, I think I was thinking actually of, uh, of bootstrapping because this is where you get um, the resampling where you could, I believe, where you can have repeats um, multiple over multiple iterations. Is that right? Or, or no, that was Monte Carlo. Okay, so this one does do the iterations where you have the fit and the, um, the fit. So you have the training and the validation. Um, so this is the training and this is the validation. Um, of that particular iteration. And then you can do this a whole bunch of times. So like we have bootstraps and we, we have the, um, the, we're taking the AIMS training and then we're doing it five times. And again, these are the create, these create tibbles that have like these splits already in them. Um, and uh, they're just, we, they're just lazy, lazily defined so that they're, again, we're not copying these things in, in, um, in RAM. Uh, boot, I guess, you know, they, they, they seem, they spent a lot more time on bootstrapping, kind of explaining it. It seems like people are a little bit more, um, uh, in general, people are a little bit more encouraged to do or are happier to do bootstrapping. Um, but what they say here is that, uh, bootstrapping tends to underestimate fits or, or the, 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 the the estimate um, in, in general. So like they're, they're saying if the true accuracy of the model is 90%, bootstraps tend to be less than that just by a little bit. Um, and, and, this, and and that varies uh, based upon how, how well the fit is. So you can have um, the bias is what they're saying here. The bias is different when you have, when you're, when you're having 90% accuracy versus when you have 70% accuracy. Um, and then they mentioned here that the, the random forest model, which I brought up earlier when we, when we first put that code in, um, is it uses bootstrapping as part of the underlying random forest. Uh, was there, there was a... I, let's see, Federica looks like you are... Uh, yes, um, is it like a sort of background noise or is just me hearing it? I can hear I can hear it. So I don't know if it's me or not. I can put myself on mute, 
my house is pretty quiet, but uh, my family's possible. roving around right now trying okay. to get out the door for school. That's, so that that's could probably be like, it sounds like some <laughs> that, children that in the background. <laughs> I don't have any children or dogs. So <laughs> I don't yeah. know what it would be. There, uh, we had a bit of a delay here. It's a it ice, ice, uh, ice on trees and roads and everything here last night. So they delayed the start of school. So yeah, normally I'd be at work well. too, but today it was uh, it was a mess trying to get to work. You're on okay. the east coast, right, Brandon? So yeah, I just, we had that We're in, in the Midwest. Like, we had that yesterday, so I'm guessing you guys have it today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it did it overnight. So we're all the trees are covered in ice. It's a bit of a mess. But more up north, they got like a foot of snow. Oh my gosh. Um, let's see. All right, here, Laura, this is where I am hoping for some of your input because okay. this is really interesting. This Yay. is really interesting though. Like, so if you have time series data and you're trying to sample time series data, you can't just randomly sample it and put 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 time mm -hmm. back together. It doesn't work. Sadly not. <laughs> and so what they do is they do like a, so they have this, they have this yeah. time scale where it's like one to 15. And what they do is they just kind of take a rolling window over that. Yeah. And then mm -hmm. they always try and fit to the more recent data. Yes. I don't, yeah. I, I kind of get I, why, but maybe you can explain a little bit further. Okay. Well, um, so I've done this kind of thing actually, although I guess I kept it, I didn't change the origin by change the end. And uh, yeah, it's basically the idea being you, and then the TSCV, if you use Fable, um, is, I would, which is one of Dr. Hinman's packages, is a really, has a good implementation of that. It takes a really long time. That's useful for univariate methods. Um, but yeah, the idea is that you are wanting to forecast out a certain amount. So you need to keep the data in the right order. Use a certain, use your observations. In this case, they're like using as, let's see, what is that? Like eight observations kind of rolling and they're forecasting like three steps ahead. Um, so then you would compare that, those three steps ahead, right? To those observations and you know group your metrics the same as you do. And the, an the analysis set, um, the different configurations. So when I did this as kind of a, for my work, um, I let it cumulatively grow. Um, and just because I was estimating, I think some exponential smoothing, ARIMA and a comp an ensemble method. So that, that can be kind of interesting because especially you want a certain amount of time series data. So, you know, the more you can have, the better, um, especially when you don't have any observations, as in my case. So, yeah, it's a really interesting way to do it. I, per I, I did it not with TSCV, but um, you can use a map function from PER. You can put in a vector of end dates. Theoretically, you could put probably use map two with start dates and, you know, um, go over that and then estimate and then collect, um, and then you could calculate your, you know, weighted MAPE or RMSC. I, my company uses weighted MAPE, so I think that's what I did. I will say I took a really, I had probably took a really, really long time to do it. I just had my little laptop with six cores, 16 gigabytes RAM, and it, it was like hours. <laughs> I was just on a Saturday, you just leave it and uh, yeah, you, you let it role so it's a it's pretty much how you have to do it though with time series because uh there's not that randomness inherent because of the time so. did i hear did i hear you right that instead of having a fixed window of say eight points here you were actually mm -hmm. varying the, yes. the window so i i basically increased the end because i i had like data going back to january 2018 my company's a little bit stingy in how much data we keep and I think I wanted to get an idea. I think I was forecasting starting September 2020, maybe. Um, so that's not really that much, honestly, for time series data, especially on a monthly basis. So I thought, well, the more I can get, the better. And, um, you know, I could have, I guess I could have just taken a very narrow, narrow sample, but I did the first variation that, uh, or configuration that is listed down there. Cool. Okay. Um, if I guess if uh, if anybody has any questions, I'll direct you to Laura. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, I can answer them. Because <laughs> uh, I, I actually think that 
I actually understood this one the most. <laughs> like why it was well, doing it. It makes sense intuitively, right? Yeah, I mean, because yeah. we all we all time is something that is, you know, very intuitive to humans. I think so that yeah. that helps. And you're trying to use the previous data, the historical data, to predict the most recent things or things that might happen in the future, and uh, mm -hmm. and so like you could do different scenarios where you know you vary some of the other variables and you're testing some of these things. Yeah, and I would say I, I don't think I mentioned this. You could. I didn't do time series linear regression in this particular thing I was doing, but you could certainly do that with trend and seasonal and you could probably do it with also, you know, um, predictors and stuff. The idea just is that this is the way you need to do the validation. So, yeah. So um, they did, uh, they, they made up some, some time slices and did some things and um, there's, there's some code here to kind of get at this data and try and understand some of it, um, but they don't go so far as to actually, I don't think anyway, to like. Uh, oh, so they're doing a 29 day skip. So it looks like they are maybe using daily data and then skipping ahead. I haven't looked, taken a really good look yeah. at it, but. Well, I mean, the, and the data is like not what's really, going on. Yeah, the data is not really data either. It's just like, uh, it's I just, did not know about the rolling origin. That was kind of interesting function. I might have checked that out, <laughs> so. It seems pretty useful. But these are the different split, some of the different splits that you can you could look at and and like this is so this is the analysis set and this is the assessment set and um, it's just it's just showing you how to make those splits and whatnot. But this is fake data because it's just one to three hundred sixty five and then it's doing the the division of that by months and so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, um, that's that's time. And then, and then the next part is, uh, is about estimating performance. Um, so again, you know, uh, if you're, if you're using resampling methods, there are specific, uh, functions called, uh, fit resamples that expects these objects that have all of the different splits in them. Um, I, I didn't try to feed one of these objects to fit but I'm guessing that it would error out and say, hey, you should use resamples instead. Um, and so like you can give it these different variations of things. So you can give it a formula, you can give it a recipe, you give it the resamples always. Um, and, and those, so obviously like the formula is part of the recipe and then the recipe and formula are part of the workflow and so on and so forth. So if, if you wanna build these things up ahead of time, you can do, and then you can just feed it excuse me, feed it the workflow and then do the, do the resampling. Um, and you can do, um, you can set up different arguments within fit resamples. So you can ask it to return different metrics. It returns RMSE and R squared by default and pretty much for all of the, all of the, the, the sampling techniques that, you know, we've already discussed above, although I didn't try the time one. Uh, and then kind of control um, in terms of like uh, um, having uh, what sort of outputs you get. So like um, um, verbose gives you uh, logical print logging. So it's like true, false. Do you want to print lo a lot more information out as it processes? I imagine it tells you which iteration it's on or which, 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 uh, yeah, which iteration it's on. Um, you later very at the very end you you can extract the um the 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 uh the fit it's the fit parameters the coefficients and those sorts of things using the extract function i couldn't actually get this to work um i ran into some error um it's at the very end i, I don't actually know if we'll get to it because um I'm dragging on a little bit, <laughs> a little bit slower. Uh, and, it, and then also like saving the prediction so you can like output um, um, the, the, predict the predicted values uh, or not. Um, if you save out the predictions, it's a, it creates a slightly larger um, output um, versus not. And so here they're doing, uh, they're doing the, the, they create this, uh, um, list with control resamples the function and they're saying i want to save the predictions and i want to save the workflow they set a new seed again and they take the uh, random forest workflow and then fit the the samples to the aims folds which was the uh i think that's the simple initial v fold um 
cross validation, and um, and then and then you you feed it the control part as well, and so you end up with a tibble that has all this information in it. Um, the dot metrics are are the performance metrics, so you have the RMSE inside. Um, dot notes um, is like warnings and errors that were generated during the the, the sampling, and then the predictions are the the predicted outputs. Um, and I've already started to kind of play with these in in with with tidy R on nest and unnest and those sorts of things. And and um, you can actually get um, the same sort of thing. So actually what I did in there was um, dang, I pulled out. Uh, you can do this where you you select the ID and the dot metrics and then unnest the dot metrics, but they created a function called collect, collect metrics, which does more or less the same thing. So um, if we look at this, the output looks like, uh, oops, one password's like, hey, what are you doing? Um, it, it, you, get, you get, for each of the folds, you get the RMSE and the R squared. And, and obviously you could pivot wider to get these to look a little bit nicer. Um, but the collect metrics does the same thing more or less. I mean, it looks pretty much the same. Um, the default, it's interesting here because collect metrics and collect predictions, which we'll talk in a minute, they kind of have opposite defaults in terms of whether or not they summarize. So if if you don't tell it to do anything different, collect metrics gives you uh, the, the mean RMSE, the mean R squared, and the number of individual folds and all that stuff, um, and the standard error for that. Whereas if you, uh, if you're you can also collect predictions. So we have the predictions um, output. So, you know, we're trying to predict the sale price and the prediction. So, so for example, for row 10, the sale price is 5.09 and that's on a log scale. Um, and we're predicting 5.10. So that one, you know, we're predicting that pretty well. Um, whereas, uh, um, and then you can also do uh, if you do collect predictions, it gives you the same kind of information. If you if you do if you have many many resamplings, it will uh, you can ask it to summarize those resamples, and so you get the average information back. This particular uh, uh, this particular model output doesn't have those things. I guess I didn't really understand that, but. Uh, it can be used to summarize over resampled or bootstrap sampling. It, although why it doesn't do that is a little bit beyond me because we said earlier the random forest uses bootstrapping. So I anyway, if you have multiple uh, estimates per row of your original data set, then this this summarize equals true will summarize across those. Um, and, and that may be useful. Um, then we have, uh, you know, we can start to, we can start to break this down and look at the outputs of it. So, you know, how well did our model fit overall? And, and, and it, it, this set will generate a ggplot2 graph. And uh, what they're pointing out here, um, one of the things that was interesting was this chord obs pred, which is from the um, tune package. It, um, makes the scale of the X and Y axes. It's like chord equal um, uh, with a with an aspect ratio of one. Um, and that and that gives you kind of the uh, so you can compare everything should be on a Y equals X sort of line. Um, but anyway, the, the, one of the key things here that they point out is like, well, OK, you know, there's some there. It does a pretty good job of predicting, but there's some out some weird outliers. Um, and then so they're like, well, OK, over predicted. Um, you know, access these things, um, do sale price minus predicted, and then arrange by that output, and then slice. They only took one slice. They said, oh, there's one, one that was over predicted, but actually there's two here. Um, so over predicted looks like this. So you can see um, there's a couple of rows, but that's not really useful. Like what, what row 32 and row 319, what are those? Um, and so you can... Um, where is that? You can you can actually look at that data 
and grab those attributes and try and understand, you know, okay, this, this one was an old town and it was built in 23 and it has these attributes. Maybe that explains why this one was over predicted by uh, a certain amount. Um, it's not obvious to me why exactly these ones stand out so much. There must be some other attributes that uh, perhaps the model isn't capturing or something like that. And I think that's the point is that you want to use these outputs to be able to say, am I capturing everything or not? Maybe I, maybe my model needs to have a different, uh, another variable added to it or something that would help explain these things or, or perhaps this is as good as it gets. Um, they did, they actually here, I lied, they did do some, val they did do a little bit more on the validation uh, part. Um, again, I, I struggled to understand that, but you can, you can collect the, the, the variables there and, and, and you get the same, the same outputs. Again, back to kind of the original part of the book where they were saying the same outputs are repeated over and over again. Um, so that everything is, uh, everything you can, all the outputs you can use in the same way. And that allows that unification allows you to do a lot more with things. Um, yeah, this is the part where they mentioned set seed, but we'll, we'll skip over that for now. So parallel processing, um, obviously when we're fitting these models and on different subsets of the data set, we can, we can send these to different processing units and, and maybe get through them a little bit quicker. There are limitations to that. They mentioned some of them um, in terms of like uh, physical cores versus virtual cores in terms of like uh, Intel chips. Um, oftentimes uh, they also mentioned RAM. Um, Every time you create like sub processors, you create a, a, a new R process and that uses the original data set in RAM. It copies it into each of those sessions and therefore you have to have enough RAM to actually do this work. Uh, but there's a bunch of different ways to do it. Um, the way to see how many cores you have that the, the, the R can see is, is this with the, with the parallel package. And um, then there's a couple of different ways to do it. They, they have the do MC, do multi-core. Um, this is for .NIC systems only. So Linux and, and Mac OS, uh, Unix underneath. Um, and you can register and then do this, do this stuff. If you want to reset it back to normal, um, use the function here, do, do SEQ. There's also a, a you know, platform agnostic par called do parallel. Where you where you you create the a cluster essentially this is where it comes into like you're running R in separate instances and you're feeding it the information from one main instance. Um, this is where copying the 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 stuff in RAM really makes a big difference. So I've run this already and uh, I think anyway I think I called it this. Um, and it it seemed to go a little bit quicker, but I, I what I failed to do was a micro benchmark, so I don't I don't actually I don't actually know. Um, and then there is a there is the future package as well. So the future package uh, has some some things they didn't they mentioned it, but they didn't show any functions on how to do it. Uh, I have used future um, a couple of times. It's pretty useful for for doing multi core processing of map functions. Mm -hmm future map and so on. It, it works really well actually for that. Um, and then the last part is about saving the output. This is the part that I actually couldn't get to work. Um, I, I ran into some problems down here where um, I got this connection error and this summary connection is like a base R function. So I must have messed something up maybe with the multi-core stuff. Um, so anyway, this, uh, this, uh, uh, the key here is that what you're doing is you're trying to pull out the the fit function so that you don't have to refit the model and you can use those fits uh, at a later time and and space to to actually um, do comparisons between models and those sorts of things. Um, and that's I want to say that's it was a, that was that last part was a little bit quick and I'm sorry but. I don't want to. I don't want to run over too much. <laughs> um, but I, yeah, the the key here is that the last part is is about being able to uh, being able to save the the and extract the, the 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 model parameters itself and put those to use somewhere else. Um, and it shows you how to do that kind of here towards the bottom. 
And that's 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 all I have for today. Um, I hope we covered enough of these things. I certainly learned a lot from you all today. Um, I thank you for your patience. Um, I knew I was going to be reasonable at early stuff, but later struggle a little bit more. <laughs> that was this is really good. I, I think you did a great job, and um, it was really informative. So right, exactly. Thank you very much, Brendan. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we're done for today. Uh, yeah. See you, everyone, next week. And I'm not sure who is the next uh, volunteer for for the chapter. The, we we have no one. Yeah, still. I don't think there's anyone yet. So you may yeah. have to pull some ears or something. Yeah. I'll, okay. I'll put it on on Slack though. Okay. Thank you very much. So right. see you yeah. next next week bye right. thank bye -bye. you bye bye, -bye.